Yes, I found a flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. If you are asked to come on Drag Race for a 10, 12 episode season, you get your package together, you quit your day job, you tell everyone you're going to get foot surgery um, because you can't tell them you're going on a reality TV show and you disappear for, for three weeks. Oops, you get eliminated the first episode. Here's your $500. Hey, what's going on? What are you talking about? Um, all of a sudden, you're locked in this hotel for you know the remainder of the filming of the season. You're not allowed to contact anyone. Uh, and you're just kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs because RuPaul decided that she didn't like you. Um, and again, here's your $500. That's two-thirds of one iPad. Good luck with that. Hi, everyone. This is John Hansen from the Systemic Justice Project in the Flaw Magazine at Harvard Law School. We're excited to bring you a two-part episode on the corporatization of drag. In it, hosts Sam Perry and Pragna Vela interview Grace Burns, a Harvard Law student and a fabulous wit, to discuss the rising popularity of drag as both a hobby and profession, and as a form of personal and political expression. In this part, Grace explains how corporate control over drag queens is reshaping drag, undermining unique local drag cultures, and harming queens who go on popular shows like Drag Race through restrictive non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs as they're called in the biz, and meager pay. Grace highlights how despite those challenges, drag persists as a vibrant form of queer visibility and artistic expression for queer identities. Welcome to Flaw School, the podcast about the flaws in the law. Hey, welcome to Flaw School, a podcast that explores the flaws in our legal system. I'm one of today's hosts. I'm Sam, and I'm a public defender. And I'm Pragya, and I'm a high school senior. And we are so excited to be hosting this week's episode of Law School. Every two weeks, we interview law students to uncover the role of corporate actors in producing many of our most urgent social problems and the troubling tale of corporate actors shaping, bending, capturing, and breaking the law in their favor. In this episode, we'll be discussing the corporatization of drag. We're joined by Grace Burns, a law student and wonderful human that I've had the pleasure of being connected with through Professor Hansen. Welcome to Flaw School, Grace. Class is in session. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. Oh, stop. Don't boost our egos too much. We are so glad to have you on, Grace. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? When did you realize you wanted to go to law school? And what do you plan on doing after graduation? Of course. So my name is Grace. Uh, My pronouns are she, they. I'm a third year law student at Harvard. Crazy. Originally from the land of Old Bay and John Waters, Baltimore, Maryland. Wear that very proudly. Um, I first knew I wanted to go to law school when I came into the world. Uh, The first thing my granddad ever said to me when he heard my name was, that sounds like a Supreme Court justice. Don't know who's going to tell them that that is not going to happen. But I guess you could say it was written in the stars. Um, When my parents wanted to get married, they actually had to pass a law in Maryland so that they could get married. So I'm a child of controversy, born to go into the law, break it and rewrite it, much like Thanos from the critically acclaimed Avengers series. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I had an absolutely wonderful time working on this piece, meeting with everyone I got to meet with, and I'm so excited to talk to you all about it. I feel like this is a separate conversation. I do want to know what made you realize you don't want to be a Supreme Court justice. Honestly, I just don't look great in all black. And (laughs) I figured that was a requirement for the job. And also, I've never seen any of them bring their dog to work. And so an an office that is not dog friendly is simply not a place I could imagine spending my career, let alone a life tenure. Yeah, that does sound like a hostile working environment. So I get it. (laughs) But I do want to ask you, is there any intersection between your interest in law, like being born into the law? Were you born into an interest in drag? Like, how did you find yourself interested in the topic? 
Um, so as someone who was born into the law, both of my parents are government attorneys in the state of Maryland. And so I was very much a latchkey child, which was a terror for my parents, but my absolute dream as a, as a young individual coming home from school, I had unfettered access to the internet and cable television in the early 2000s. And so that really did a lot of damage. Just kidding. Um, a lot of personal development happened um, from the hours of 3 to 5 p.m., Monday through Friday. Um, and that was also the time that a uh, drag weight race would play on um, television when I would come home from school. So I would come home, eat my little snack, obviously six to 10 bags of Utz potato chips and watch drag race before my parents came home. And that was kind of the initial, um, I guess, harbinger of me being interested in drag. And then my parents would come home and talk to me about what they did at work today. So I guess there was kind of always that connection there, but it didn't really come up for me until I had the opportunity to write this piece. And it was the really like the first thing I thought of and the last thing I thought of. And I'm looking forward to never thinking of anything else ever again. <laughs> And I love that. And that was so real of you. Thank you for sharing. I was going to ask what your after school snack was. So I'm glad you touched on that. Um, can you walk us through your piece a bit? Like, I know Pragni and I ate this piece up. But for those who haven't read the article yet, can you fill us in, kind of give us a bit of a play by play? Of course, yeah. So this piece was kind of the, the brainchild that I birthed uh, in Professor Hansen's corporations class. I know a lot of great brain children have been birthed in that class, and so it was my honor and privilege to bring yet another beautiful child into the world through Professor Hansen's uh, corporations class. I walked into that class on day one, and he said, so there is an optional paper or an exam, and I said, oh, hey, stop talking. I'm going to write the paper immediately. Um, and then I thought, where are we going from here? What are we going to do? Um, and I you know, have often got some great advice from a lot of law professors on campus. Also some terrible advice, but I don't pay for that, so I don't talk about that. Um, but the good advice I have gotten is, like, do things that you're really excited about. And I think the most profound piece of advice I've gotten from Professor Martha Minow was, like, anyone, almost anyone will talk to you if you tell them that you're a Harvard Law student and you want to interview them. So, like, whatever you can do to have those opportunities pursue those and I was like okay I would love to talk to a bunch of drag queens obviously um so I decided to do this kind of topic purely as an avenue through which I could get the personal phone numbers of <laughs> several of my favorite drag queens and then it kind of evolved from there into being something that was very interesting and something I really had a good time writing about and I think that's the best way to do it um but can you kind of like tell us like what are the different sections of your piece? Kind of what specifically are you writing about when it comes to the corporatization of drag in your article? Sure. So I think the first thing is that I really want to like thank the queens who were willing to meet with me. Um, I emailed and DM'd over 150 different queens from Drag Race. And the people who responded were really, I think, some of the best people to offer their voices for what ended up being this piece. And I could not be more grateful to them for taking the time to chat with me after I got over the first like 10 to 15 minutes of me being like oh this is crazy oh my god and you're here on this zoom with me right now this is wild um we kind of talked a little bit about their experiences and I got to learn a lot more about the kind of behind the scenes of what goes on in drag race and I was very lucky to have a very broad kind of swath of queens to talk with who had been on the show in its early ages, who had been on the show more recently, who had positive experiences on the show, negative experiences on the show. Um, and even RuPaul's uh, drag daughter, Lady Bunny, wh who had never been on the show, but has often kind of been referenced on the show. And they really gave me some very interesting perspectives on kind of what is really going on um, behind the scenes, positive, negative, critical, all of that. And as I was speaking with them, I realized there is a little bit more going on here than I think I thought. I was like, oh my God, this does connect to corporate law. This isn't just like me doing something fun for fun, not me learning. Okay, Professor Hansen. Um, so <laughs> I had these conversations and I really wanted to write something that spoke a little bit to the kind of, I think, manipulation that doesn't necessarily get talked about a lot when it comes to drag race because it's so overproduced and because there is that essence of like 
yes, this is fake. Um, I think that leads a lot of more critical questions to being kind of not discussed as much or not really um, more brushed under the rug than I think a lot of people would initially see when they watch the TV show. Um, so having those conversations with them, getting to the bottom of, you know, why did you leave Drag Race? Or why did you decide to like make all of your costumes out of completely recycled materials? What were the broader messages behind those decisions? Um, and wh why, why are you happy or why are you a little bit disappointed that it didn't work out the way you wanted it to? Amazing. And I don't, I feel like you did name all of the queens that you actually interviewed for this piece, um, kind of just like here and there, kind of naming them as you were just speaking. But can you just, for the fans out there, just hit them all right now so that way we make sure we are naming all of them, giving them the credit that they deserve? Oh my gosh, of course. So um, I spoke with Tempest Du Jour, absolutely lovely person. Um, I spoke with Lady Bunny, who is really an entrepreneur in the purest sense of the form. Might be, um, who's that guy, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank and Drag? I don't know. I've just never seen them in the same room together. So who's to say? Um, I also spoke with Benda La Creme, actress, um, choreographer, dancer, really everything. And the incomparable Tammy Brown, who is really, I think, the essence of the universe put into the human form. If one day we find out that Tammy Brown is like God, but in corporeal form, I don't think I'd be like super surprised just because of she knows the secrets of the universe and I want her to tell them to me. Those are the people I spoke with for the piece. I spoke with some people over email who said, um, no, thank you. We're too busy to talk with you right now for free. And then I said, that is a great point for me to put into the article that you were too busy to talk to me for free. So I won't be naming those names, but thankful to everyone who responded and especially the individuals I got to chat with. Awesome. So let's talk about something specific that one of the drag queens that you did talk about mentioned. So in your article, Ben Della Creme highlights that drag used to have distinct cultures and styles within different regions. Could you talk a little bit more about the broadening of drag's visibility and how that has impacted these unique local drag cultures? What were some components of drag that used to vary city by city? Sure. So this was something that I think was much more prevalent in the earlier seasons of Drag Race before it became so popular, before it became such kind of this global phenomenon. Um, there were people on Drag Race who were doing kind of the earliest forms of basic drag, which Tempest calls and the kind of broader drag community calls booger drag, um, which is very much like the first kind of foray an individual has into drag. You know, it's not expected for them to look good. Um, they're not expected to look pretty or beautiful or anything of the sort. If you want like a visual picture, I don't know if you've seen that image of J.D. Vance in drag, but that is kind of booger drag in the purest, most essential form, the, the Plato's form of booger drag, if you will. Um, and so there's that kind of early aspect where you have queens who are just starting out. Um, and that's really everywhere kind of universal. And that's been largely wiped away because of the expectations that the audience has now that every drag queen is perfect, that they're all, you know, TV ready um, because of, again, the expectations Drag Race has brought up. You also have more kind of performance art or alternative based um, drag queens, which is still largely exist, but I would say that a lot of them are concentrated in the more metropolitan areas, the artsier areas like New York, you have um, Christine Vale, you have Narcissister who are doing um, kind of more social commentaries on the artistic experience of drag and really relating those to experiences of um, gender and sexuality, um, race in the broader culture. You have uh, pageant drag, which is something that has been really popular on Drag Race recently. It's a very much like Southern Belle kind of similar to toddlers and tiaras, except they are grown adult humans um, who are also in tiaras. And they are doing the standard kind of swim swimsuit competition, um, wearing the beautiful beaded gowns with the tiaras. And they do actually compete for... Um, titles on a national and international level. Um, there are really all different kinds of drag that used to and still do exist. But I think that what Ben kind of picked up on very aptly was the sense that because of how popular drag has gotten on, you know, a national and international level, um, 
you lose some of the ability for those kind of organic subcultures to exist and to thrive. Um, so like speaking from my experience, like um, Baltimore used to have and still kind of does have a very vibrant, very, um, I guess, elaborate drag scene. Um, but recently, I think in my lifetime, and certainly from before that, there has been a major shift towards a more polished, a more kind of presentable um, sense of, of drag. You know, you used to have drag queens that would get up and just like eat like 15 hot dogs in a minute. And like that was their drag thing. And I'm, hey, I'm living for that. Okay. Far be it for me to stand on a stage and eat 15 hot dogs in front of an audience of people. I normally do that in the privacy of my own home. So like go off. Um, but now it's much more of like you expect to see someone get on stage, lip sync to a Beyonce song, and then like pull off a cape and surprise there's an outfit under their other outfit. And I think that is what Ben kind of picked up on the sense that because of how popular drag has become, because of how popular drag race and how influential this kind of archetype of the drag queen has become from what we're seeing on drag race you lose the queens who are able to eat 15 hot dogs in a minute. And I'm not saying that like we don't know where they are because they're there, but I'm saying that they're not doing it on stage anymore. They're doing it immediately before they go out on stage. Let's talk a little bit more about these new expectations for drag queens. So in your article, you wrote about how drag has historically served as a form of protest. You explore the transition of drag from an activity masked as a masquerade ball to a more mainstream and accessible form of entertainment. While drag is no longer illegal, how do you see drag continuing to form as a function of political participation in today's context by challenging societal norms despite increasing corporate control over the industry? That is such a great question. Um, and I think something that I didn't really know a lot about particularly like the the early early history of drag until I started researching for this piece so again shout out to Professor Hansen for like accidentally making me learn something when I really tried my hardest to not do that um and so I was really knee deep in like the passenger seat of the Harvard archives trying to figure out what the history was here and I saw a lot of wonderful articles I saw a ton of amazing pictures that I was able to get from the archives to include in the piece um, that really go through this this history of drag first as something that was legal and people were getting arrested for to something that was, you know, a more accepted kind of form of offbeat political protest um, to now where we've almost kind of come full circle back into drag being another form of political protest. Um, today, I think you see drag into kind of major veins um you see it in i guess more like liberal spaces where it's something to be really celebrated and uplifted um a lot of i guess more ideologically liberal individuals are behind that kind of idea of free speech and free expression and do whatever they can to uplift those people and then i think you see the more kind of politicized version of drag um kind of coming out against a lot of those uh, drag bans or restrictions on how people can present themselves in public. And so I think that is the main avenue where people use drag as this uh, rejection of those popular ideas that are gaining more momentum in today's society. Um, something that I do think is interesting is how we've seen drag today come into more of a hobby space because of the popularity of drag race. I've seen more casual drag queens in the last year than I have maybe in the last 20 uh, other years of my life. I'm not 20. I'm so young, actually. Um, like, I think that the hobbyification of drag has been one of the good things to come out of the popularity of drag race where, you know, I'm able to expose like my really conservative father to drag just because we happened to be at a bar where a drag queen was performing. And so I think the two kind of major um, outcomings of the popularity of drag race, making it easier for people to use drag as this kind of political protest, but also making it easier for people to bring drag into more everyday, modern, attainable spheres are, are two of the major ways that I think corporations have, at least for now, been stayed off of taking that, taking over that realm of the performance. Let's talk a little bit more about like the effects of the, po the increased popularity of drag. 
In your article, you talk about your conversation with Lady Bunny and how mainstream media has disadvantaged drag queens by taking away the necessity of actually having to pay to watch drag. Now you can just watch it on your TV at the click of a button, and this undermines the venues and the drag acts themselves. Based on what you learned, do you think that this increased visibility and ease of access to drag content online does also help drag queens by spreading awareness and helping them reach new audiences? And if so, does that benefit of increased accessibility outweigh the, the harm? How do you see this balance evolving in the future? So I think I'll take your, your question in kind of three parts. Um, so I think like to answer your first question, I do think that this kind of increased visibility from having drag so accessible on streaming platforms on YouTube and TikTok um, helps drag queens by kind of spreading awareness about the art form, obviously increasing acceptance um, and helping drag queens reach new audiences. Honestly, like one of my favorite things to do is like go on TikTok live and like watch drag queens like do their makeup and like I do my makeup with them. And then at the end, I like look at myself and I normally have pounds of makeup caked on my face and then I compare myself to them and I'm like oh my god just come on natural diva slay um, <laughs> but I think that there is obviously kind of the barrier there that Lady Bunny picks up on where if you're not paying to support this individual and the art that they're putting out you have to kind of question how much value you're really imparting on them and how much support you're actually imparting on them um, there is also the angle of, you know, you're paying for a streaming service. So, you know, you're paying, what, $8 a month um, for Paramount, which is where Drag Race is being streamed from these days. And you can kind of think, okay, well, maybe some of that is going to the drag queens. Um, and so, you know, you're watching the ads, you're kind of giving back that way. But you're still not going to the bar, like Lady Bunny said, and going and sitting and giving your money to these queens in person. And I think that is kind of an, an aspect of, of drag that I have seen become a little bit more uh, awkward and a little bit more rare recently, which is that kind of act of like physically handing your dollar over to the drag queen during her performance and having that connection and making that kind of um, public statement of like, yes, I support you. I love what you're doing and I wanna keep supporting what you're doing. You don't get the same kind of um, feeling or ability to have that personal development when you're like tapping your credit card for apple pay to tip a drag queen or you're like sending hearts on like a, a live stream on tiktok or something um and i think that kind of person to person connection is something lady bunny and uh tammy brown and tempest and really everyone i spoke with um missed a little bit um but to answer your second question does that benefit of increased accessibility outweigh the harm i I do think that the benefit of increased accessibility outweighs the harm. Um, Tempest spoke a lot about this in, you know, my question of what do you think about um, the recent increase in like pride merchandise or in um, non-binary merchandise, specifically with, you know, the target pride lines that we saw a few years ago, asking her what she thought about that as a drag queen, as um, an academic, as a parent. And she talked about how, you know, she doesn't really care if that extra money is going to line somebody's pockets who is already already very rich or who is already very successful um, because of the way that that visibility would have impacted her when she was growing up, um, you know, as a very closeted kind of uh, repressed individual. And so from her perspective, even if there is a little bit of, of harm in the sense of supporting this kind of inherently capitalist um, and manipulative economic structure that underlines a lot of these pride campaigns or, you know, similar kind of avenues for viewing drag and other kind of queer art forms, it is at the end of the day beneficial because you have no idea how many people are going to see that representation and be reaffirmed and feel a kind of safety that they haven't yet had the opportunity to feel by viewing that representation. To answer your third question, how do you see this balance evolving in the future? I see this kind of balance almost kind of coming to a, a reckoning 
as I think a lot of different subcultures um, in like, modern society are, um, particularly with TikTok, um, streaming, uh, the culture wars, all of those things, you have to wonder if we are ever going to reach a boiling point. And I think that the first kind of aspect of that begins with a lot of labor organizing, um, particularly like I think the idea of a drag queen union would be amazing and wonderful um, and really go a long way to help queens make the money that they deserve for having this kind of impact. Um, but hopefully, obviously, I would like to see the balance evolving more towards uh, benefiting individuals and um, increasing the accessibility and awareness of drag rather than these kind of harmful capitalist structures that we've been entrenched in for really long. So kind of touching a little bit more on the capitalist structures and the corporatization of drag. Um, and I'm thinking really about how you just talked about the access that people have to drag through platforms that you might pay some like relatively small amount to. Um, and when I think about like the economic impact that has on Queens and specifically thinking about the Queens on drag race, just because you talk about that a bit in your article, specifically talking about um, how Queens have to sign an NDA to participate in drag race. Um, it really made me wonder kind of what sort of bargaining power do Queens have with regard to their participation on the show, right? Like an NDA for those who don't know the details, haven't read the article yet. We're thinking about an irrevocable license to reproduce, display, distribute your name, your image, and your likeness. That's huge. It's like a lifetime thing. Um, and so I guess I'm just wondering what you think about that. Oh my God. Yes. Thank you for bringing this up, Sam. Um, that was something that is kind of like a, a meme within the drag race community of like how ironclad the NDA is. Something that a lot of great articles have been written on. A lot of queens have spoken about it very publicly, how manipulative it is and has become. It was something that came about, I think, early um, in the kind of reality TV sphere when individuals kind of first realized like, oh, we can make money off of these people having them sign something like a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA um, really allows you to have complete control over what the narrative is moving forward. And that can be really beneficial if you're somebody who's, you know, a producer on a show like Drag Race, where you are trying to create these storylines, artificial or not. Obviously, as Drag Race has become more popular, the NDA has become a little bit more ironclad because like you mentioned, Sam, there's just not the bargaining power of a group of queens, let alone one queen who isn't very well known, um, who, you know, kind of has Willy Wonka show up to her house one day and be like, hey, you want to go be a drag queen on the national stage? And it's RuPaul herself. And she says, just sign this NDA. It's giving very much the Little Mermaid. It's giving very much like Ursula having Ariel sign her voice away kind of moment. Um, and you don't even get like a cool necklace afterwards, which is kind of honestly the biggest scam in the universe. Um, so moving from from that kind of the increased bargaining power that Drag Race has compared to these queens, um, something that I did hear from my conversations with different individuals like Tempest or um, Lady Bunny is this, the increased sanitization that Drag Race has kind of accidentally or purposely brought into the drag sphere um, has led to very interestingly, a preference on the large scale for this kind of archetypal drag queen, you know, very like beautiful young twink, um, loves to do pageant drag, very palatable on a large scale, but also is ready to kind of sell her soul to get into Hollywood, which, you know, I love and I'm living for that. But something that a lot of queens mentioned to me is like, literally drag race is running out of twinks to put on drag race you're running out of drag queens who can perform drag at the level that drag race is requesting um because they're the twinks contrary to popular belief are a finite resource and twinks who are good at doing drag are a finite resource and so there is a little bit of increased bargaining power that you're seeing now when it comes to signing this nda of the type of drag that is going to go on the show or the type of individuals that are going to go on the show because rupaul herself has also mentioned some of the girls on recent seasons you know they don't have the experience they don't have 
the the kind of breadth of knowledge that you need to have to get these references that drag race is based on or to compete in these challenges rupaul makes these references to to mommy dearest or to other kind of queer cultural mainstays that are 50 30 20 years old and these young kids that drag race is kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel to get on tv just like don't get it and i'm here like beautiful wonderful 16 year old me having watched drag race for the past 45 years being like girl what are you talking about you don't get that reference hello mother um we need people who know what's going on in this kind of culture we can't just have beautiful wonderful people be put on television to be drag queens because drag is about so much more than that do you feel like there has been a reckoning with that like publicly on drag race or that is is that something that's really going on behind the scenes that people are just all talking about like what's gonna happen like we see how that's looking on tv and that's not what people are coming to drag race for so i think there has been a reckoning um i think increasingly we haven't reached a tipping point yet but there has definitely been more conversation about it among the drag race community um, recently because of losing that aspect of going to see a drag performer, um, you know, losing the aspect of actually having to kind of work your way up through the drag sphere has led to a lot of people being on drag race because they're popular on social media and because, you know, they have really wonderful and beautiful makeup skills or their costumes are very beautifully done. But in elevating those people, you have to realize that a main part of the show is your ability to perform and to engage in a lot of those kind of core drag art forms and representations of queer art. And so in recent seasons, you've seen people go on the show who just don't know how to lip sync to a song because they've only ever done it on, you know, TikTok where they can control absolutely everything about it. Um, and so it has left the audience, I think, in a lot of circumstances wanting more. But that also counterbalances against the amount of power that the producers on Drag Race have to show you what they want to show you, to cut things the way that they want to cut things and to produce the narratives that they have. And so that also is another aspect of it, which is, you know, you're seeing this person who doesn't have a lot of experience be put on this national stage and be, you know, performing this kind of kind of poorly. And you have to ask yourself, like, they're showing us this because they want you to see it. And it's almost kind of unfair for them to go out and scout this person knowing that this isn't their strong suit and then highlighting something that is not their strong suit to such an intense degree. You talked about how the increased visibility of drag has allowed individuals to pursue drag casually as a hobby. But on the other side of that, in your article, you mentioned how due to the increased commercialization of drag, individuals are able to pursue drag as an actual career rather than just a hobby too. In fact, you reported that some of the most famous drag queens have an estimated net worth of between 2 and $10 million, or as you would put it, doll hairs. However, Ben De La Creme also brings up the point that this has led to a scenario where some performers might be more driven by economic incentives rather than a genuine passion for drag. How do you think the shift in motivation affects the authenticity and artistic integrity of drag as a whole? Are the financial benefits changing the way drag is approached and perceived within the community? Okay, so two questions there. Um, the first, kind of how do I think this change in motivation affects the authenticity and artistic integrity of drag overall. Um, I think this is something that has come increasingly hot take, maybe not a hot take actually, like many things, this came out of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, after the kind of brief recovery of that we saw after the 2008 financial crisis, we saw more individuals going to college to pursue these kind of um, artistic endeavors that they really wanted to have. Um, but in a way, we never really recovered from the 2008 financial crisis, um, kind of sad reacts here, but also, you know, queens graduating from these colleges with bachelors in theaters or um, bachelors in musical theater who are realizing oh, there isn't as much of a market for the skill that I've cultivated um, as I really thought that there was. And so now you're seeing more and more people kind of pivot and taking those professionally developed skills and using them for drag, which is in many ways a double-edged sword. Um, so you're seeing individuals who have these 
really well honed uh, skills for dancing, singing, acting, which are kind of the fundamental basics of being able to succeed, um, particularly in the drag race sphere of drag that we have today. But it's also, I think, leading to more individuals who are getting into drag, not necessarily because of the love of it as an art form, um, because of it being an avenue through which they can, you know, explore themselves and explore gender identity and expression, but because it can be a really great way to make some money. Um, something that I think Tempest and Ben touched along that goes with this a little bit more, though, is you're having more conversations about the kind of debt that people are being asked to take on in order to go on Drag Race and to engage in these very popular kind of forms of exposure for young drag queens. And so whereas I think maybe a few years ago, you know, the the BFA drag queen was somewhat of a menace or a meme within the drag community you're seeing now with these conversations about the amount of debt people are coming off of drag race with, even after winning, um, you know, you're, you're having individuals maybe put in a second thought before going into these careers without really thinking out if this is something they want to pursue. Um, I am not really sure to your second question, whether the, the financial benefits are changing the way drag is approached and perceived within the broader community. Um, it's definitely something I think that has changed the way that people are engaging with drag queens as personalities or as individuals, but not necessarily within the art form as a whole. Um, Lady Bunny talks about this a little bit where drag race really pushes people to become famous based on a catchphrase. And they really push drag queens who are already themselves caricatures of this character character that they've invented um, into becoming even more, uh, more so of a caricature and even something that is marketable on a mass scale. So, for example, when I when I speak about this, as far as like individual queens go, you have queens whose whole brand is almost a subset of drag, where they have almost become like the flag bearer for that aspect or that identity of drag. I'm thinking in particular of like Lady Bunny, who has become the pallbearer for like, you know, older kind of um, more campy, fun drag. Um, and then you have queens who maybe a little bit more like uh, Crystal Method are a little bit more kooky and who are kind of like the scion for like weird alternative drag and so on and so forth. So I don't know if the financial benefits have changed the way that we view the drag scheme overall, but I think it definitely has changed the way that we view the subgenres of drag in that they've helped to establish these kind of uh, archetypes for what does this kind of drag mean what does it do and how should this kind of drag queen act? And on the point of queens kind of like feeling this increased drive to create a brand for themselves, right? Something that's marketable past like drag race, for example, it makes me think about the financial benefits that actually come with being on drag race. And I know we talked a bit about this before we actually started recording today, but maybe like naively, I was so surprised to learn from your piece that queens are only paid $500 per episode of Drag Race, excluding recaps and reunions, and that there is 5% increases per season in that payout. I can't imagine I'm the only one who was surprised to learn this, because to me, it's like they're queens. Of course, they're being paid like queens. I don't think of that as being $500 for all of the hours that go in to participate in one episode. Like you've talked about like the time it takes to get ready, the time it takes to shoot, and also the energy it just takes to do all of those things. I don't think $500 is nearly enough money. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, like, how do you think, I'm going to say the corporations in this vague sense, because I think there's a lot of different corporations that are playing a role in this. How do you think they've gotten away with this of just like, here's your little like meager payout for all of the work that you're doing that's making all of us super rich? So that was something that I was very surprised myself to find out the the details of the drag race NDA. I knew it was strict, but until kind of reading a lot of the leaks and talking with some of the queens who have signed different iterations of these NDAs, these non-disclosure agreements, um, it was something that I genuinely could not believe. So like you mentioned, you get $500 an episode, excluding recaps and reunions. So that basically means, you know, if you are asked to come on Drag Race for a 10, 12 episode season, 
you get your package together, you quit your day job, you tell everyone you're going to get foot surgery um, because you can't tell them you're going on a reality TV show and you disappear for for three weeks. Oops, you get eliminated the first episode. Here's your $500. Hey, what's going on? What are you talking about? Um, all of a sudden, you're locked in this hotel for you know the remainder of the filming of the season. You're not allowed to contact anyone. Um, and you're just kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs because RuPaul decided that she didn't like you. Um, and again, here's your $500. That's two thirds of one iPad. Good luck with that. Um, and I think that kind of incentive, that financial in- incentive really pushes people towards this this fame based on a catchphrase, because those kind of things are things that you can trademark. They're things that you can market. They're things that you can, you know, sell, sell yourselves. And so that used to be kind of a happy accident to come out from Drag Race. You have people like Tammy Brown, who I spoke with, who were very much, you know, organically became famous after the fact or were before famous before the fact just because of the kind of person that they are and the kind of personality that they have. But then you have queens who are going on more recent seasons um, with this explicit goal of, you know, this is my catchphrase and I'm going to make this happen so I can put it on T-shirts. And a lot of the queens I spoke with, again, kind of pointed out the double-edged nature of this, which is, you know, the corporation in having them sign these NDAs Um, gains a lot of control over these personalities and gains this legal ability to recreate their likenesses in in perpetuity um, really, you know, forever. And so now you have queens who have no other option than to just try to to stay on for as long as they can. And then even if they succeed in making this fame based on a catchphrase, like Lady Bunny said, they're still screwed in a lot of avenues because they've already sold anything that they create and their likenesses um, to to drag race. And that leads to the question of, you know, who is really benefiting from this at the end of the day? Because it's it's not the queens, um, you know, sure, they gain this kind of social capital or notoriety that we all, you know, aspire to have maybe. But it's not like social capital is not going to put food on your table. It's not going to pay your electricity bill unless you're like really rising up the electric company. Like it's not going to do anything for you at the end of the day. And it's certainly not allowing these queens to build businesses for themselves and to build independent brands. You've seen very few queens who've been successful at doing this. Um, you know, you have Trixie Mattel, you have uh, Kim Chi who have become very successful business owners because almost they haven't been able to make that fame based on a catchphrase. They've actually gone into makeup or other sort of independent creative ventures that Drag Race couldn't have a hold on through that NDA. And so a lot of the people who have seemingly been the most uplifted by Drag Race are people who have survived and thrived in light of being uplifted by Drag Race and by those non-disclosure agreements. So you mentioned that there are these queens who have actually like done super, super well, like Trixie Mattel, like you're talking about, because they've been able to find loopholes, basically, in the NDAs. Um, I guess I'm wondering, do you think that basically the corporate entities have just become like really good at storytelling as well about Drag Race? Of like, these are queens, they get all this social capital, like you mentioned, and it makes people not even wonder about the financial realities of the show, because they just assume the queens are doing well. Um, or do you think, I guess I'm curious, do you think the corporations are really not even like thinking like that because they see how these other queens have done well despite the NDAs and are like, we don't even need to worry about it. We don't even need to think about it. I think there is definitely a, a calculated effort, particularly in more recent years, to put less emphasis on the, the financial undertaking that queens uh, have to go through to get onto the show. Um, there's a couple different ways. I think I've seen this play out um, from the way that the producers are producing the shows and the storylines. They're not focusing as much on um, reusable or kind of uh, sustainable aspects of the show. So in the past, um, when the show was a little bit less known, there were challenges, design challenges on the show where queens would have to go dumpster diving and, you know, create an outfit from that, or the queens had a little bit more freedom over um, how their narratives were perceived. There were a little bit more discussions about the financial aspects and difficulties that can come with 
uh, performing drag. Now I think it's very much um, sanitized to, in the way that you mentioned, where the show knows that these things are becoming more common knowledge among the fan base, but also among, you know, consumers of the show popularly. And they obviously don't want to talk about that because of the critical acclaim that the show has been getting, um, because the show, you know, has been such a trailblazer as far as queer representation goes for award shows, for just kind of broadcast television. You have this desire to want to keep um, doing well and elevating queer voices and winning those Emmys and things like that. But you have to counteract that against the fact that, you know, that requires really purposeful storytelling. Um, and that requires very intentional producing that is not necessarily going to be benefited from you talking about the fact that you're taking advantage of all of these um, people and performers who are engaging in this kind of inherently um, anarchic sort of platform. To answer your second question about you know, do you think producers assume that the queens do well from the show itself, or maybe they're becoming a little bit more aware of these loopholes? I think that's something that producers have been trying to close as much as possible, to be honest. Um, in the most recent season, and I talk about this a little bit in my piece, is comparing the mini challenge with the Tammy Faye Baker prints, uh, the face makeup prints on the t-shirts, to the art that Tammy Brown has been producing for the last six to eight years. And so those kind of face prints and those, those art prints that they have the queens put on t-shirts and then immediately start to sell, um, that's not something that is inherently, you know, something like Trixie Cosmetics that they can prevent queens from engaging in. But if you think about it in the way of capitalizing from, from their labor, they're literally taking their makeup, their face prints, almost something like as unique to individuals as a fingerprint is, a face print is for drag queens and using that as another way for them to trademark something, as another way for them to retain ownership of it. And so, you know, you think people with iconic makeup, if they had done that for Trixie Mattel, they would own literally the copyright for her makeup um they could have her stop using that at any time they could license that and market that and so i think the the show has also been using these discussions over financial loopholes or the financial difficulties of of drag queens to close a lot of the avenues that queens used to have to be able to establish themselves as business people past drag race in addition to the meager pay that you and sam mentioned and Drag Race's strategy to monetize things that the drag queens do while limiting the queens' ability to benefit from it independently. In your article, Tempest also talks about her time on RuPaul's Drag Race and says, It was 10 years ago that I was on the show, and I still have debt from the costumes, the hair, the shoes, and the makeup. So I want to know, do you think the investment is at all worth it in the long run for the queens? With the meager pay, debt, and overall exploitation, what motivates the queens to go on Drag Race? I think for a lot of queens, probably the overwhelming majority of queens, it is worth it. Um, especially, like, speaking from my perspective as somebody who is 20 years old, about to graduate from Harvard Law School, my expectation of, you know, what kind of investment is worth it is going to be very different from the expectation of, you know, a, a queer kind of artist growing up in the Rust Belt who just wants to do the things that they really love to do and now has the opportunity to make even like more than minimum wage an hour or even get paid to do something that they really love to do. Um, and so I think obviously this is a question that varies from queen to queen, but overall I do think that this investment is probably worth it. Um, even with the, the manipulation that you have going on now, having more queens continue to go on drag race and then be willing and be so gracious with their time, like Tempest and Lady Bunny and Benda La Creme and Tammy were willing to speak out about these kind of experiences that they have had makes it, you know, those kind of um, makes those kind of outcomes that we want to see like uh, unionizing, like collective bargaining agreements, like kind of um, an end date on NDAs make those things more likely. So even if it causes, you know, me, if getting paid $500 for 24, 48 hours worth of work isn't something that necessarily tickles my fancy, it's something that I do see a value for 
within the queer space, within the art form overall. I do think that there is kind of this, to answer your second question of, you know, what motivates queens to go on drag race with knowing about all of this debt, knowing about all of this exploitation that they're signing up for. I think queens do it at the end of the day because of hope and because they have seen these queens who have gone against the grain and who have, despite everything being set up against them, still um, succeeding like Trixie, like Katya, like Lady Bunny, like even RuPaul. You know, you watch footage of RuPaul in the 80s when she was walking the streets and engaging with hookers and prostitutes and sex workers. And you're like, I'm not saying that that's Jesus, but that is my Jesus. Um, and you see the kind of hope that she had for the future and the way that that drag could be perceived and queer people and sex workers could be perceived. And she's really brought a lot of that into the fold. And so you think about the exploitation that's going on now compared to some of the things that that queer people have experienced in the past. You have this opportunity to go on this national, international platform and yes, sell your soul a little bit, but also have job security for a few years. Also have access to all of these advertisers who wouldn't care about you at all were it not for the fact that you agreed to go on the show. And so I think the queens really continue to go on Drag Race because of this desire to share their art with the world and because of this desire to continue broadly to be part of uplifting queer voices in, in popular culture. Thank you for listening to part one of this episode on the corporatization of drag. Our theme music is by Crystal Squad, and you also heard Palms Down from Blue Dot Sessions. Part two of this episode is available now. You can pick up the conversation as Grace spills tea about how some queens are resisting the worst elements of corporatization. <laughs>